in San Diego, California. He attended, the, he attended UC Irvine and graduated with a degree in anthropology in 2008. After college, Nick started his career in informal science education as a presenter at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. This position helps him discover a passion for talking with people about science and the ocean and would eventually lead to a role at the, the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. New opportunities led him to Monterey Bay Peninsula and to the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History, where he would manage their educational programs and also had the opportunity to learn and work closely with monarch butterflies. However, the pull of the ocean would eventually lure Nick back to his roots, and Nick now works at the Monterey Bay Aquarium as manager of public programs. Nick lives in Pacific Grove with two silly kids, <laughs> a goofy dog, and his lovely wife, Katie. So please welcome Nick Stong. Thank you, Terry. Can you all hear me through the microphone? Is that working? No? Green light is... Oh, it's just to the camera. Okay. Do I need a microphone or can you all hear me okay? Okay. Steve or anyone else, is there a clicker for the slides or should I just operate it from here? Here is fine if that's... I can just do... It is, but I don't know where it is. That's all right. This totally works. Let me just do this. I think it's this. Is it this thing? I'll just use the keyboard. Here, and maybe I ought to put this on. Okay. Test. No. I can use the handheld if. I think we're good. We yeah. good? Yeah, there's. Okay. I'll. Ooh. Hearing something out of them. Okay, I'll just I'll project. I think we're okay. There's a pointer. <laughs> oh, actually, I'll take that. Okay. All right. Um, thanks everybody for coming out. Thanks Terry for the introduction. Um, my name's Nick Stong, as she mentioned, and I currently work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. But had um, a few years at the the Natural History Museum in Pacific Grove, where I got to. Um, be exposed to monarch butterflies and really um, got very interested in them, worked closely with them for a while. Um, first though, I wanted to say I'm honored to be speaking here tonight. And um, when I saw some of the speakers in the weeks leading up to tonight, I, I kind of thought how I ended up among the ranks of uh, PhDs and astrobiologists and everything else. Uh, I do want to lead with, and my caveat is I am not a monarch scientist. Um, I'm not an insect scientist. I'm not really technically a scientist. Um, I know quite a way to start a talk. Uh, but um, I'll explain why I think I am uh, qualified to share m my experiences that I had with monarchs, hopefully share the excitement and what I find so um, interesting about them. I'm sorry, I would come out front, but then I, I have to be able to advance my slides. Um, so, Terry already said this, so I don't need to say much about it, but um, where I do have experience is in informal science education. So while not teaching science in a classroom like Steve and Terry have, um, I have taught science on whale watching boats. I became a certified whale watch naturalist while working down in Long Beach. Um, went to classrooms all over LA County with a big semi truck full of sharks and, and live animals that we would bring students up onto. Super, super cool. Uh, then made my way, as Terry mentioned, up to the Cal Academy, which if you haven't been and you have the opportunity to, definitely go. Aquarium, three-story rainforest dome and a living roof all in the same place. It's really, really an awesome place to learn about science and experience it. Supervised a team of presenters here, got to handle snakes on the job. I'm a big reptile lover. My son knows that. Um, so that was a really fun part of that job for me, doing dive shows with uh, scuba divers in our tanks. Um, then this is, uh, you know, of import for tonight. This is where I was introduced to the monarch butterfly. Um, I became the sort of regional or county 
representative for the monarch counts. So every winter, the, the three winters I was working there, I'd go out into Monterey County monarch sanctuaries and count the butterflies and work with a team of volunteers that would help with that. Also got to do other cool things like dissect gi a big giant squid, um, run summer camps, and um, clubs of junior naturalists that we would take out on nature excursions every month. Um, so I, I really do like talking about science, animals, nature, and all that stuff. And then eventually ended up at the aquarium where I am today, which it's an okay place too. Um, okay, but tonight uh, we're talking about the monarch butterfly and um, I wanted to start sort of with the basics. Um, so some of what we'll learn about first is applicable to all butterflies, uh, or at least most. Um, but then we'll dive a little bit into what makes the monarch exceptional um, and different from most other butterflies. So, oh, so yes. Um, some of the things that do make monarchs exceptional, uh, well, on some devices anyway, they are the butterfly emoji, so that's kind of cool. Um, but it speaks to how captivating they are and how compelling they are for cultures and people all over the world. Compared to other butterflies, there are many, many species of butterflies. They are larger on average. They soar instead of flutter. Has anyone ever seen a, a monarch? flying through, yeah, yeah. So with many other butterflies, in fact, with some of the mimics, Steve, in some of your slides, you had the, um, the viceroy, and that uh, mimic, also the painted lady looks a bit like a monarch. They have an erratic, constantly flapping flight pattern. Um, with a monarch, you tend to not see that. They're slower wing beats, and then they're one of the only mo uh, butterflies that has kind of a soared or soaring flight. So you'll see them just lock their wings in place and soar like a jet, uh, which is really cool to see with their, their large wingspan. Bright, easily visible wings, they are poisonous. We'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and perhaps most notably, they undergo epic migrations. We'll definitely talk about that. So starting back at the beginning, like all other butterflies in the world, they start their life as an egg. So this is a monarch egg. Um, and monarchs are known for their beauty. And I think that beauty starts right from day one. Their egg, I think, is really, really uh, fantastic looking. It has these corrugated, ridged edges. Um, this is a highly magnified pic picture. They're, they're, you wouldn't see it unless you had magnifying glass or we're really looking for it about one millimeter by one millimeter so like the tip of a pencil and the egg is an egg for a very short period of time three to four days and out hatches a butterfly right no no caterpillar uh, so here is a hatching monarch caterpillar uh, they come out and they are a very hungry caterpillar they will start eating immediately what do you think the first thing they eat is? Their egg shell, yeah. So you, you can kind of see this one's munched along the edge. All right, the laser's dying a little bit. Oh, there we go. Of its egg case, that'll be its first meal. And then because this is a monarch caterpillar, it will then go on to eat the only thing it will ever eat in its entire caterpillar life. Anybody know what that is? Milkweed. Saw it on some shirts today, yeah. Milkweed. And this is, this is the point at which the monarch diverges from a lot of other butterflies, not all, uh, in that it has a host plant. So it is tied to and has a relationship with a specific um, genus of plant, uh, the milkweeds. Uh, there are many types of milkweeds in the world, um, I think 70 to 90 species, um, about 30 in the US that monarchs are known to use with some regularity. Um, and the thing about milkweed is it is poisonous. So it has a toxic sap. Has anyone ever encountered milkweed or have it in their garden yard, seen it before? So if you find a plant and you're not sure if it's milkweed, a good way to find out is if you pluck one of its leaves, if it's milkweed, it tends to drip a white milky sap. Um, and that sap is what contains the, the poison that is ingested or eaten by the caterpillar. Um, it, it contains a compound that's a cardiac glycoside. So it's actually found in a lot of heart, um, heart disease medications. Um, and if taken in too high of a dose, it can stop um, a vertebrate, mostly vertebrate animals, hearts from beating. Um, so by eating 
solely this host plant, um, monarch caterpillars build up a really high level of this cardiac glycoside, this, this poison, in their tissues and in their body. Um, and that's one of the things that makes them special. Talk a little bit more about milkweed later as well. Um, so as this caterpillar is growing, um, and you can see these bright coloration, the adult but butterfly has bright coloration obviously as well. That's a signal, a posomatic coloring, meaning coloring that warns of some sort of toxin or poison. You see it in dart frogs, and you see it in monarch butterflies. Um, the thing that, that I find remarkable about the caterpillars is their growth rate. So here, this is an illustration, but we see the egg here. The caterpillar will move through five different stages of growth that we call instars. So it's going to grow through these five different instars, and between each stage or instar, it sheds its skin. So it'll have these five sort of growth stages as it gets bigger and bigger, and this will take about 10 to 14 days or about two weeks. To sort of show just how much it's growing from that first instar to the fifth final instar, you um, you can see here, this is a newly hatched monarch caterpillar with its egg case, and this is a fifth in star, just about ready for the next phase. So they're increasing their body weight and their size by a factor of about 2,000. So if you compare that to humans, uh, if you think of a human baby, you know, eight pound newborn baby, picture that baby at two weeks old weighing 16,000 pounds, about the size of a school bus or bigger. Um, so it's sort of an unfair comparison when we compare us to the, the insects and their faster growth rate, but uh, still pretty remarkable how quickly it's growing, but also speaks to just how much of this toxin, this milkweed toxin that they are packing in as they grow. Oh, there's that in case you couldn't see it. <laughs> um, so it's been an egg for two to three days, a caterpillar for 10 to 14, and now it's ready for the next stage. It's ready to pupate um, or, and become a pupa. What happens in between, so you'll know that your, your caterpillar is about to do this, when it begins to roam. So we'll, on this picture or in this picture, it's on a milkweed leaf, but they'll often leave their milkweed plant, they'll leave their host plant, and they'll find a suitable place to hang and to pupate. They then spin a small silk button here. This is its head here. It has these papillae or antenna-like things that hang off that help it feel stuff. But these are its last set of um, proto legs. It has six of its normal thoracic legs up here, but then it has these five sets of proto legs in the back. Its final set are going to work like little pinchers. So it will um, spin this silk button and then pinch those last set of legs into the silk as its anchor. It's gonna need a nice strong anchor to hang there for about another two weeks. Uh, we call this the jaying phase because, I mean, to jay. Uh, um, so it'll do that and it kind of does these upside down crunches for an hour or so. And you know it's getting ready, it's loosening up its skin. It will then, its skin will sort of part right here. It will slough off one final shed of skin. Um, and then what's revealed underneath is the pupa or the chrysalis. We heard the term chrysalis before. Yeah, we heard the term cocoon before. Does anybody know the difference? Cocoon has got the silk around. Yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. So she said the cocoon has the silk around the outside like a silkworm, and that's, that's right. So typically with butterflies, we have the chrysalis. Um, basically what a chrysalis is, is a caterpillar sheds it, its skin, and its body is just the chrysalis underneath. So its body becomes um, the pupa. And this is, again, typical with butterflies. With moths, they don't, well, their body turns into a pupa, but first they spin a silk cocoon around themselves. So a butterfly does not use a cocoon. It's a moth thing. Um, so if you see that silky cocoon around a pupa, you're going to have a moth emerging. But with the monarch, and again, um, beauty at every, at every stage here, I think. It has this sort of gold striping here on the top has these little gold buttons down here, um, and its, its proto-legs have now fused until this, into this little stem here at the top, where it will hang for another 10 to 14 days. So two to three days as an egg, 10 to 14 as a larva, 10 to 14 as a pupa. We're talking about a month from the egg laying to um, the butterfly eventually emerging. So it has that aquamarine or seafoam green coloration until about 24 hours uh, to hatching. Then it's going to go translucent 
You can finally get that first glimpse of those monarch wings. It's going to push itself out um, and emerge as an adult butterfly. Uh, here, you know, initially on the left, it doesn't look anything like kind of what we would expect. And if, if you were watching this in your garden, you might be worried that something was wrong. But it had to fit those big wings inside the pupa, so they're not quite um, expanded yet. Its abdomen is also engorged here and really swollen. It will begin to drip a meconium, so this uh, sort of metabolic waste fluid from the abdomen for an hour or two. It's bright red. It kind of looks like blood. Um, and then at the same time, they will pump or fill their wings with hemolymph, which is sort of the insect equivalent of blood. It's their, the fluid in their body. And then after an hour or two, they are dried out, big um, wing, extended wings, and ready to be a butterfly. From this point forward, the monarch does not need milkweed for food. It will need it to reproduce, to lay its eggs. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But from this point forward, it no longer has the mouth parts it would need to eat milkweed leaves if it wanted to. It just has a proboscis. So it has this tongue-like, or I should say straw-like appendage. Uh, right here, you can see it sort of going out and down. That's the proboscis. Um, and it will drink nectar for the rest of its butterfly life. Oh, I thought I had a note on here. Um, so I had the life or the length of time it took for each phase leading up to this. So for the adult butterfly, their typical lifespan is three to six weeks. So they're pretty short lived, maybe an average of around a month or four weeks. But when I had that up here, I had a bunch of asterisk, asterisks on there because there, there is an exception and there are certain monarchs that live a lot longer. And that's where the story starts to get interesting. So depending on where this monarch has gone through these stages of caterpillar, pupa, emergence as a butterfly, that will dictate whether it has a fairly average short life or an extraordinary long life. And I promise that'll make sense soon. So I'm going to show this map a few times tonight. Um, so I'll explain it a little more this first time. This is a map of. North America here, most of it. And the first thing I want to point out is this white. So most of the color that you see is monarch range, okay? places where monarchs can be found at some time throughout the year. This white strip down the middle here, can anyone venture a guess at what that is? Rockies, the mountains. Yeah, this, this is the Rocky Mountains. And what's important about that is that the Rocky Mountains form a geographic barrier between two main populations of monarchs in North America. Um, the eastern population, which is over here, and the western population, which we experience over here. The reason the, the Rocky Mountains are a barrier, and there's very little mixing between these two populations. There are some instances of, of mixing down here, but we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. Um, the reason this is a barrier is monarchs are ectothermic. They're cold-blooded, like a reptile. So they're, they're, uh, the temperature of their environment determines their body temperature. Unlike us, who we can shiver and warm up uh, or sweat and cool off and sort of regulate our own temperature, monarchs don't do that. If it's 55 degrees outside, they're going to be about 55 degrees. Uh, conversely, if it's 99 degrees, they're going to be nice and hot and warm and the metabolism pumping and flying around and moving. Um, so the Rockies, which have many 14,000 foot peaks, relatively high average elevation, with that elevation comes cold temperatures, right? So if a monarch were to try to fly from east to west or from west to east, it will have to go up first and eventually it will get high enough that it would get cold enough that they would just have to stop flying. Wouldn't be warm enough to keep their cold blooded bodies going. So this acts as a pretty effective barrier between these two main populations. What about the Sierras? The Sierras are, are probably a similar effect. There probably aren't a lot of monarchs going over the highest parts of the Sierras. That doesn't mean they can't go around. No, it's wondering how they go in between. Yeah, so they would have to go in between or you know, around. The Sierras would sort of split and form another um, gap for, for the Western population. OK, so first I want to talk about the Eastern monarchs, and then I'll talk more about the Western. 
So let's say that process we just talked about, caterpillar to pupa to adult monarch. Uh, hypothetically, let's say it's late August. It's towards the end of the summer, and a monarch is up here around the Great Lakes near what is labeled here as the northern range of milkweed. Milkweed's a plant that needs a certain amount of sunlight, a certain amount of heat, can't go too much warmer. But at the end of the, towards the end of the summer, it's going to be stretching and blooming up here near its northernmost limit. Uh, southern Canada. So let's say this monarch, it's late August, and it has e emerged as an adult butterfly right about here. It will notice that days are getting shorter. Um, the sun, the angle of the sun is getting lower in the sky. It's something is cueing that butterfly that it's the end of the summer. Uh, milkweed's potentially dying off. And that butterfly, along with all the other butterfly monarchs, that are emerging up here on this northern part of their, their range around this same time of year, instead of looking to mate and lay their eggs and find milkweed, they're all going to delay that. They're going to go into a diapause, a reproductive diapause, and say, we're not going to mate. And instead, we're all going to fly 2,500 miles to Mexico. <laughs> and you can't do that in three to six weeks. So this generation of monarchs, just the ones that emerge in, at the end of the summer up here in the east, all together they delay sexual reproduction and they migrate over the course of about two months, um, as far as 2,500 miles, to this remote area in Michoacan State, Mexico. High mountain peaks, oyamel fir trees, cloud forest, um, and they go down here to overwinter. So if they were to stay up there in that northern range, frost comes, snow comes, again, cold-blooded animals, they would all perish. They would all pass away. Um, so they leave that area and make this massive migration. So this, I'm going to show a few images of those um, Oyamel fir forests there in Mexico. First of all, has anyone ever been to those butterfly, those monarch sanctuaries in Mexico? I haven't either. But uh, yeah, I, I hear it's pretty amazing. It's a big ecotourism um, draw for that area. So you can sort of see, looks like a bunch of leaves, a lot, like a lot of the leaves, I, beautiful leaves I saw here in, in Modesto driving in tonight. But this is all monarch butterflies solidly packing these trees. A little closer, you can see, yeah. Um, it's said that they get so thick and so dense in these um, Mexican overwintering sites that they can knock over trees. They can, uh, yeah, which seems unbelievable. Um, they can definitely break big branches. Each monarch only weighs about half of a dollar bill's weight, um, but there are just so many of them. Here's another overhead image. So, although that looks kind of grayish, well, yeah, I think you're pointing out that it doesn't look really bright orange. Yeah. That'll come up a little bit later, too. But a monarch is only that bright orange, so I can't really do it. But let's say I'm a butterfly. If my wings were closed, which monarchs would close them this way, not this way, um, and say my legs are out here, this part of my wing would be gray, pretty gray, like a dead leaf. And so it's really effective camouflage. Um, it's not until I open them up that then the back of my wing as I'm flying is that bright orange part. Um, and uh, when we talk about, if you go to the central coast to visit the monarchs, there's times that you should go if you want to see one thing versus the other. Some people love to see the clusters up in the trees, but it's kind of gray. Other people love to see them flying in the bright orange. <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit later about counting the monarchs. There are so many in these Mexican overwintering sites that they're counted by plane and helicopter. So they fly over, and you can see the trees are just tinted orange because there are so many monarchs in, in hanging out in these clusters. One last photo of just the density there. <clears throat> okay, we'll round out the eastern monarch story, and then I promise we'll talk about the western. Um, so they've hung out here. They've arrived around October or November. A cool thing uh, culturally about the monarchs in this part of Mexico is in a lot of these areas, even in southern Texas, um, as they migrate through, by the time they're down around this area, it's um, getting late October, early November. The arrival of the monarchs coincides and has for hundreds, if not thousands of years, 
with Dia de los Muertos um, celebrations. Because it's around that same time of year, it kicks off a lot of those celebrations, and the individual monarchs are thought, um, at least by some cultures and in some areas, to be the returning souls of lost ancestors. So it's a, a, a neat cultural significance to this um, natural phenomenon. Uh, it was also only discovered by Western science, at least, in the 1970s. So there was a great National Geographic article when this was discovered. Uh, there was a, um, a man, I can't think of his name, a scientist who was sending um, observers all over the place trying to figure out where the monarchs went because people in the U.S. would experience them heading south and then they would kind of just disappear. And it was in the 70s, in the 1970s, that um, some travelers that happened to be working for this scientist from the Midwest stumbled upon these forests, these high mountain forests in Mexico and found the overwintering sites. Okay, so they're there. It's quite exclusive forest. It is. They are pretty... I th they think they're... Right, I think they're pretty remote areas and it's a pretty tight packed group of mountain tops where they're found, all around 10,000 feet. So they've arrived around October, November, December, January, February. Um, they're going to be hanging out in these clusters, clustered together for safety from predators and to, uh, to avoid the worst of the elements, rain and wind. But then the season starts to change and let's say March arrives, the butterflies are going to begin to stir, they're going to begin to, w begin to warm up, Met uh, their metabolisms begin to ratchet up. They will mate, often in the sanctuary, um, and then once the female has fertilized eggs inside of her, she will leave the sanctuary looking for milkweed. So again, this is when she needs milkweed again. She won't lay those eggs on anything other than her host plant on milkweed. So she'll begin to fly north. She might make it to, well, basically the first place she finds milkweed, she'll begin to lay those eggs, about one egg per plant. She'll have about 300 eggs, need to find a big, lots of milkweed to lay all those eggs. Um, so let's say she finds that in, in southern Texas, sometime around March, she will then lay her eggs and she'll die. So she, remember, she's been alive since the previous August. She's lived six to eight months, really, really long for a butterfly. So then these eggs that are here in South Texas, they'll go through those stages we talked about, about a month's development, the adult butterfly emerges. It will immediately look for a mate and begin to look for milkweed. It will only live three to six weeks and it will fly a little bit further north with the emerging milkweed as it pops up in the spring in central and, and northern United States. It will lay its eggs on milkweed and then it will die after its short life. Then that next generation will emerge. They'll find a mate. They will begin to fly a little bit further north. They'll find some milkweed, three to six week life, lay their eggs and then they'll die. Okay, so this goes on for about four to five generations beginning in the spring through the late summer. That takes us back eventually towards, so now it's again late August, the fifth or sixth generation has emerged again, days start to get shorter, something cues this one generation again um, to delay sexual reproduction and they're going to fly 2,500 miles down here. So it's not only a multi-generational migration, um, it's also um, so yeah, multi-generational and also different lifespans depending on where you are in this cycle. So if you happen to emerge in August, you're going to live six to eight months. If you're anywhere else in the other generation, just three to six weeks. It's crazy, right? Um, one thing that I think is really fascinating about it, if you kind of play it out, the monarchs that go from the northern United States to Mexico have never done that before. They're four to five generations removed from the last monarch that did do that. So there's no teaching, there's no passing on of some sacred knowledge. They just, something tells them, fly south, and they somehow find these same sanctuaries every year. Okay, but remember, everything I just talked about, those aren't the monarchs we see, okay? <laughs> I know, I promise. I promise I'll get there. So that was all just the eastern monarch. Of course, we're over here. What about Florida? So there are some exceptions to the two stories I'm going to tell. There's a non-migratory population here in southern Florida, probably be because of the climate down there. It's warm enough. There's milkweed um, year-round. The butterflies here, there are some butterflies that sort of figured out or decided, we're just not going to do that migration thing. What milkweed do they have there? 
I'm not sure, but probably a more tropical, a more perennial variety, one that doesn't die back each year, it just persists. Which leads to a higher, there are much more parasites found on these monarchs here in Florida because of that perennial non-dying back milkweed, and I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Okay, so I do wanna talk about our monarch. So, rewind, let's restart that story. Let's say it's late August, uh, you're a monarch, you emerge somewhere here in British Columbia or on the northern part of the range, up here, Idaho, Washington, Oregon. You notice the day's getting shorter. You are that super generation. You're gonna live six to eight months. You and all of your monarch friends who are emerging around the same time are going to leave and you're going to go on a long migration towards an overwintering site. It's not quite as long. In fact, it's quite a bit shorter than what we see with the, the Eastern Monarch migration. The Western Monarch maximum migrates about 1,000 miles. So if you are at the far northern reach and you go all the way to one of the southern overwintering sites in California or Baja, you'll go about 1,000 miles, whereas on average in the east they're going about 2,500. Our monarchs are still cool over here, but just not quite as long. Um, okay. So then, their overwintering sites, there's not just one. Pacific Grove gets a lot of press. We are Butterfly Town, USA, but Pacific Grove Monarch Sanctuary is one of about 300 overwintering sites along the coast of California. Has anyone ever been to any other monarch sites in California? What, where? I just got back to the Beach. That's a big one. They had about 24,000 Wow, family. that's awesome. Yeah, PG has about 12,000 right now, so Pismo often has some of the highest numbers in California. Where Anyone else? Natural, natural, natural bridges? So natural bridges is another big one. It's in Santa Cruz. So natural bridges, Pacific Grove Monarch Sanctuary, and um, Pismo Beach. Okay. So, but then this the story follows a lot of the same patterns. They arrive in October. Uh, we'll count our first monarchs in Pacific Grove typically around the beginning of October. Um, they stay there through springtime. They mate in the sanctuaries. It's a, a neat time to be there to witness that. Um, but it's not nearly as many um, monarchs. So nice big clusters, at least in Pacific Grove. Um, these are some good ones. As you noted before, it's, they're hard to see sometimes. We'll oftentimes have folks walk right through the monarch sanctuary and go, oh, guess there's no monarchs this year when there are tens of thousands in the, in the trees. So we try to have volunteers there a lot so they can say, no, no, they're right there. Um, especially with the lace lichen hanging from the trees. This is a Monterey cypress tree and the butterflies are hanging from the lace lichen. Um, here's a pretty good cluster here. This is a good view. I don't know if you'll be able to tell. Um, most of the gray closed wings, but there are some right in here that are kind of fluttering, fla uh, opening their wings a little bit. You can see a little flash of that flame orange color. Another view from below. And then beginning in, in the spring again, there's, there's mating that happens. So the males chase the females. Um, they fly, the, they, if they can capture a female, they tr attempt to fly her up high into a tree. Um, many times this is unsuccessful um, and the female breaks free, so only the strongest males um, are able to mate, um, keeping the, only the strongest, you know, longest flying um, monarchs in the gene pool. Here's a couple more images of one of those flight attempts on the left there. And then if anyone ends up seeing monarchs in your yard or wanted to know how to tell the males from the females, we have a male here on the left and a female on the right. Anybody tell what the differences are? The male has the two bulbs. The two spots? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So right back here, there are these two little spots. These are, if you look at them under a... Um, Microscope, they're little raised bumps, uh, kind of a cluster of scales that they think might r release pheromones or scents to let um, other monarchs know, hey, I'm a male. Their lines are also in general thinner. So um, looks like they were drawn on with a, a sharp point pencil or a pen, whereas the female's lines, again, no, no dots, and then pretty thick lines back here. Can you see those things? Mm -hmm. Nice. 
Okay, and so then in the spring, after they've mated, the females will leave the California coast and begin to spread out across their range as milkweed begins to emerge anywhere from Central Valley, California to um, Colorado, Arizona, foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, um, Oregon, Washington, and as far up as British Columbia. So when should they cross the trees? When should what? When should we be seeing them? So theoretically, all the Western monarchs right now should be at an overwintering site, if they're following directions. Um, and then we should see them coming back, uh, I would say, yeah, beginning in March, maybe at the earliest. Yeah, kind of depends when things warm up each year. Okay, I think this is just a review here. Okay, so one thing I got to do at the Pacific Grove Museum is, and we'll talk a little bit about population trends here in a moment, but what we know about monarch populations, at least here in the West, we know from going out to these overwintering sites in California and counting them. Um, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, they work on everything from beetles to butterflies and even aquatic invertebrates. They're a really great scientific organization and nonprofit has a lot of publications online and resources um, for all invertebrates, but monarchs included. And they organize this Western Monarch Thanksgiving count. Has anyone ever heard of the, the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count? Cool. Um, and the museum, the Pacific Grove Museum, was a big participator in this. And, and that's where I was the coordinator for all Monterey County overwintering sites. So here is the PG Monarch Sanctuary here on the peninsula. But it is just one of eight main overwintering sites in our county, stretching down to South Big Sur, just about Cambria once you're this far down. Um, so we would have volunteers who would drive over an hour to get to these remote groves of eucalyptus trees where we knew there would be some monarchs. Yes? So is Modesto too cold in winter? It would be too cold in the winter, yeah. But it's not. Yeah, yeah. So they, um, monarchs, find these groves of trees that have a very specific microclimate. Um, they need the temperature to, to be above about 55 degrees Fahrenheit to fly around. And so as they're overwintering, um, they need to be able to warm up during the day enough to go out and find nectar and refuel, uh, but then they, they can't have it getting too cold to where their body freezes. Um, so if there's a hard frost anywhere, that can be problematic for monarchs. All right, so when we talk about counting monarchs, especially with dense clusters, and after we see some of the pictures of the dense uh, groups of monarchs, people often ask, like, how in the world do you count them? Um, and so I thought I'd run us through a little tutorial of how we count the monarch butterflies. So this is an example of one of the, a pretty good cluster that we might find. This is, again, in a Monterey cypress tree, one of their favorite trees to cluster in in Pacific Grove. And we would have a team of maybe three, four volunteers. You have to get up really early and get there right around sunrise because, again, if the temperature starts to get above 55 degrees, the monarchs will start stirring. They'll start flying around. And one of the things people ask is, how do you, if they're flying everywhere, you're just like, one, two, three, four. So if they're flying, you can't count them. Um, so in fact, the data, um, even if you've counted for an hour and all of a sudden now it's, it's 8.30 in the morning, it's a warmer day, late November, we sometimes have some warm spells, um, and then now some butterflies are flying. If we see more than five to 10, what we call flyers, even if we're almost done, we just have to scrap the whole count, throw away the data, and try again another day. So we get there early when it's nice and cold so no butterflies are moving. So we find this cluster. We would not count every single w butterfly. We would look through binoculars. This is sometimes 60 feet up in a tree. Um, we would look, and we would find a piece of this cluster, and we would count a part of it. So I might say, all right, down here on the left, look through binoculars. OK, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is about 20 butterflies. Okay. Then in my head, I'm going to sort of draw a little shape around those 20 butterflies. So in your mind, you're kind of doing this, okay? You're noticing how much of this cluster that 20 butterflies covers. This is also, I think, how they count waterfowl on bodies of water where there's just a ton of ducks and they want to count. So I'd again be looking through and say, okay, how many times would that shape transpose over this larger cluster? And I would go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, sort of moving it around in my mind, right? And you might come up with something like this. 
not super scientific, right? So there's a margin of error here for sure. But remember, I'm doing this with other people that I'm counting with. So I go, okay, this is about 17 times. So I say 20 times 17, 340 monarchs there, if my estimations are at all close. There's also a provision for if you think this cluster is three-dimensional, it's like super three-dimensional and dense, you'll add 30%. So if I had 30% to 340 or 85 monarchs to this, I'd come up with about 425. And so I would have my data sheet and I'd write that down. I'd kind of keep it to myself while my buddies finish their count and we would turn to each other and then we would all share our number. And as long as we're within 20% of each other, then we'll average whatever numbers we have and that's our count for this cluster. If someone else is like, I got 650, I'd say we'd go, okay, that's more than 20% apart. Let's count again, because that person might say, well, did you see, oh, I counted those ones up there. Oh, I didn't count those, okay. So we would do that sort of back and forth, and we would do that for every cluster. So yeah. would you have to walk around to see those clusters on the right and the left? Of the we, it depends, sometimes we can't. So there are, the sanctuary is fairly small and it's confined by private property. So in some cases we're at a fence line looking over and so we can't, we have one angle in, in some cases. In other cases we can, we can get underneath, we can check both sides and sort of figure it out. Um, but if you imagine uh, on a good year Pacific Grove will have 15 to 25,000 butterflies. And this was a cluster of about 400. So it takes, it takes a while. So you're starting early and you got to move fast or else as it warms up um, they start to fly and you have to call it off. Do they return to the same cluster, or do you know? Day by day, or each, I guess it couldn't be each year. Um, we don't really know, to my knowledge, because there are, when it warms up, they, they leave, there's tons of flying that happens in the sanctuary. The city has planted a lot of nectar plants so that they can fuel up and feed during the day. I'm not sure that much study has been done on whether, the, whether or not they go back to the same cluster. It's a good question, though. Okay, and what that data tells us, um, and so this is happening at, well, the, the idea is, since, again, theoretically, every Western monarch around Thanksgiving, the reason it's a Thanksgiving count is late November, early December is the peak of the overwintering season. It's when they should all be in one of these California overwintering sites. So if we're able to get enough volunteers around the same time, you know, if we're doing this a month apart, there's a chance that the monarchs I count today are the same monarchs that someone else counts a month later at a different sanctuary, right? Because if the monarchs just leave. So around the same couple of weeks, we all try to blanket these sanctuaries in California and count, then we compile all the data, and that should be the total Western monarch population for that year. And that's been done every year since 1997. And it gives us some, a pretty good idea if not, of, if not a super accurate, you know, there's a plus or minus 20% uh, in the, popular, the raw number, but it does give us a pretty good trend, we think. And what we've seen is a, a really big banner year in 1997, over 1.2 million monarchs counted total across California, um, and then a, a declining trend um, over the past two decades. The blue line, um, is how many sites were counted that year. So um, here in 1997, they only counted at about, wait, at about 100 sites. So they only counted 100 overwintering sites and they still found 1.2 million butterflies. Last year, for example, we were able to count, not we, but Xerxes, um, organized volunteers to count at nearly 300 different sites. So they had to go and search 300 overwintering sites and still only found a little over 200,000 butterflies. Um, so there's been a marked decline. Uh, what's interesting is that the, the Eastern monarch population mirrors this same trend. So again, they count by helicopter and plane and they, they determine how many hectares of which I think a hectare is about 2.5 acres, how many hectares of monarchs that year, or of forest that year are covered by monarchs, and then they have a calculation for how many monarchs per hectare. So in a really good year, there were 18 hectares covered, and last year about 2.1. So again, 
all the data pointing to um, a decline. And we can talk about why in just a moment. Counting isn't the only type of data being recorded. There is also a lot of tagging studies that happen. So um, many butterflies are too small to be um, tagged. You know, you, we tag sharks and whales and birds, but butterflies, it's like, how does that even work? Um, they're kind of like a fruit sticker. So you think of an apple sticker and they, they have a, a number for the, res the researcher. The color often tells, tells you some information too in case you're not able to read the number or get a good enough picture. You can at least say, hey, Monarch Quest or Joe Billings who does work out of Arizona, I saw one of your monarchs in the PG sanctuary. When we see a tagged monarch, it's always the most exciting thing. Whenever we're counting, we're not only counting and comparing numbers, we're also always keeping an eye out for tags because they really are valuable um, data points. Okay, um, when it comes to the decline, because I can't see my future slides, I'm not sure how much more we have uh, slides. Um, one of the biggest uh, reasons for the decline, uh, scientists think, is loss of breeding habitat. Um, and so when we think of breeding habitat for monarchs, what does that mean? It basically means milkweed. So uh, with development, um, houses, shopping centers, freeways, a lot of that, the, the what? Agriculture. Agriculture, I wasn't gonna say that in this room. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, in this town. Agriculture, agriculture can be, um, monarch friendly. So one of the things I would get asked about a lot in, in when I would do talks in Pacific Grove is GMOs, genetically modified crops. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, the, the science isn't really out on GMOs for human health, or at least that I, that I have seen, Not, nothing saying that they're you know, going to cause cancer or anything like that. Um, but when it comes to monarchs, the reasons GMO um, crops can be problematic is when you think of a Roundup Ready crop, so a crop that has been genetically engineered to resist um, herbicide. So you have crops like, and this is common with the Eastern monarchs more, I think. Um, you have Roundup Ready corn. So they're able to plant these vast corn fields that they can spray with Roundup and it doesn't affect the corn because it's been genetically modified. Milkweed is a plant that thrives in disturbed areas. So the side, the edges of an agricultural field, in between your crop rows, along the side of a freeway. It's really a resilient plant. Um, but when those Roundup Ready crops are sprayed, it kills all the other plants. So that a lot of those um, last holdouts that milkweed had um, are eliminated in those types of situations. Um, that's a big one. Deve coastal development, so I won't leave us coastal folk out of the, the blame either. It is a problem when you think of these California overwintering sites. Uh, they're, they're boxed in in a lot of areas, as I mentioned, by private property. So protecting those remaining overwintering sites um, is, a, is a big way that we can help on the policy front too. Um, but when it comes to what you can do, not everyone has a yard or a garden that you can plant milkweed in. But if you do plant milkweed, it's definitely, in Pacific Grove, we'd have to be really careful because milkweed doesn't grow along the coast. And when milkweed is planted at the coast, it can confuse the monarchs into breeding at a time of year when they're not supposed to. Um, and when they emerge in the spring and they find milkweed right where they are, they sometimes won't kick off that eastbound migration. Um, but here, this is, this is milkweed habitat. There's no, nothing to really parse out. Except, and this is a big one, and then I'll get to your hand, um, tropical milkweed. So if you go, and this is where, why it's really tricky, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or any big box store and you go and buy the milkweed off the shelf, nine times out of 10, maybe 10 times out of 10, unless you have a really um, I don't, a conscientious Home Depot manager, it's gonna be tropical milkweed. And that's not what you want. Uh, the problem with tropical milkweed is it acts as a perennial. It doesn't die back in the winter. It, it blooms year round. And because of that, there's a parasite found naturally on monarchs that um, is deposited on milkweed when they lay eggs. Well, with a native milkweed that dies back in the winter and is an annual plant and regrows from seed the next year, those parasites die off each year. A lot of the times, home gardeners that have tropical milkweed and keep them indoors or in greenhouses and put them out and then very, very high levels of parasite. This, it's an OE, it's a protozoan parasite. You can't see it. Your plant might look completely healthy, um, but it's, um, it's been proven to reduce reproductive and migratory success in monarchs. So 
Um, and it's tragic because folks who are trying to do good have all this milkweed and trying to help can sometimes be introducing high parasite loads into the populations. Um, so what do you do? Get in touch with local native plant nurseries. You might have to get online and see if you can order some seeds of native milkweeds, a little research. You have some native milkweed seeds, awesome. Um, and it, it can depend where you live. Um, Xerces Society has a really good milkweed seed finder where you can punch in where you live, tells you like the best nurseries to go or what, where you might need to order them. Do you have a? Yeah, could a milkweed be harmful to pets? Yeah, it could be, yeah. So if you had a really indiscriminate <laughs> eating dog, like a dog that just eats everything, yeah, you'd want to make sure it was kind of potted. boxed in or potted or up high. It can be, livestock tends to avoid it. Um, but yeah, it is toxic to um, vertebrates. I mean, most things figure out that it tastes bad and makes their stomach hurt before it's going to cause any fatal effects. Um, but yeah, it could potentially give someone so tummy ache. Tropical milkweed is what we sold here, which I grew. Oh, and yeah. Did. But I've also learned that if you cut it back, mm -hmm. I was, you can cut But a lot of mine does die off. Yeah, and if it dies off, that's, that should be okay. The comment that was made is if you can't get anything other than tropical milkweed, um, cut it back, um, cut it back in the fall um, and in the, when it would naturally be dying back. Yeah, it's, it's dying, but yes, you do. You just, you don't, what you don't want is, um, well, I'm get, we had certain um, recommendations we would make for people coastally, and I'm trying to think how it would be different here. Um, but yeah, when those an annuals would be dying back in the winter, once it gets cold, that's when you'd want to bring it inside, cut it back, and then let it regrow the next, the next season, just to reduce those parasite loads. I think there's, you know, I'm not I sure. Some have been told. I know some have been banned sometimes. It has been banned in some places. Yeah. More research needs to be done. I mean, more research never hurts, I don't think. But I, what I do think is native plants are always best. Yeah, I'm, I'm if not, and it won't only um, benefit monarchs, it'll benefit all the other animals that might have had that native plant in their habitat 100 years ago. Yeah. Um, but again, if you can't find anything other than the tropical, um, it, it might be better than nothing as long as you cut it back and keep those parasite loads low. Yeah. That's awesome. Narrow leaf is what we would recommend in um, Pacific Grove as well. Yeah, I get those. Uh, I also wanted to point out that several counties have banned. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what she said. said. Yeah, and yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I wanted to finish, and it was a good segue to it with the native plants. Sometimes people ask, this is my last slide, I know we're going a little long. People ask, like, why should, why should we care about monarchs? Are they really that great a pollinator? What would really ha go, you know, who cares? They're beautiful, okay, I get it. And I think um, what I really like to think about is monarchs are an indicator species. So if, the, if our local environments and the way that we've modified the landscapes aren't healthy enough to support monarchs, chances are there's a lot of other insects that we just can't see because they're not big and beautiful and noticeable. We haven't been tracking them because they're beautiful. So think of all the beetles and mites and decomposers and all of these really important parts of ecosystems that have probably had these drastic declines as well. They'll also benefit if we can restore habitats to a place where they can once again support monarchs. Lots of other animals are going to benefit. Um, so we've tracked these declines in this species because it is charismatic um, and really noticeable. But um, chances are there's a lot of other insects and animals that have declined, um, and we can bring them back as well. Oh, this is for, whoops, this is different. Next time. OK, that's all I have for you all tonight. Thank you so much. I can take some questions. Thank you.